I recall back in 2019 um, November that I had a, a general meeting with many of my counterparts from overseas and in many of those discussions because of the great networks that I have within infection prevention control and infectious diseases I was warned that there was a challenge located in China and the possibility that this might have very well might very well be um, a, uh, one of the, the globe's biggest challenges in terms of becoming a pandemic and so it became. I remember quite clearly in the meeting in January um, which I had called um, really highlighting this concern and at that time I think the QEH um, did a few important things and the truth is that Horses Point cannot survive without the QEH and I think the QEH what we did at that particular point was to try on island to get all the personal protective equipment that we possibly could on island um, recognizing that this might be a challenge in the future and as you might recall it wasn't very too far from then um, later um, in that month towards February that the pandemic was called internationally. On March 17, 2020, staff at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital's Enmore Isolation Centre, St. Michael, was stood up. Weeks later, centres at Blackman Gollop and Paragon Christ Church and Harrison's Point St. Lucy were to follow. Barbados had started its battle against the deadly COVID-19 virus. These are the insights of our first COVID warriors. A bit fear at the first time. As everybody be scared to the fact of this coronavirus. It wouldn't be easy on anybody, on families and stuff. Show the whole world. Um, uh, eventually, I get to overcome it. As working on a Harrison Point facility and seeing it firsthand. I began at the Amores, where the first patient was admitted to Amores institution. And my first thought of it was obviously you'll be a little nervous of the situation of what's going on with the pandemic. But basically, it was in the venture, it was a good experience to know whereas you're going to be taking care of someone who can at that time take care of themselves to make sure that they get better and to come out eventually to go, to go back into society um, amongst their family with um, positive, a positive um, attitude and negative results and whatnot. So I remember it kind of like yesterday. I was uh, just about to head off to work and I got a call that I would have to we actually were one of the first doctors along with uh, Dr. Ford to, to actually treat a COVID positive patient um, and that for sure was a surreal experience uh, for me. I knew it was going to be a, a challenge but I knew I had a group of young doctors who were very willing and eager and competent and so I took on the challenge as it came. It was a bit unnerving at first but then it quickly settled after I internally said a prayer and nerves quickly went. Of course there was that initial trepidation um, of working with someone with this illness that has been causing trouble all over the world. Um, so there was that initial nervousness um, but I tried to take comfort in the fact that we'd received adequate training um, and how to put on our protective equipment and whatnot and that there was adequate protective equipment as well as adequate guidance should it be needed uh, from Dr. Ford and our infection control department. I didn't have any major thoughts because as a professional we are we have a duty of care to all patients and as long as there is no immediate danger in the area we are obligated to, to, to give care to the patients regardless. We started um, at Blackman and Goddard last year in March. Um, so that was, that was kind of a challenge at the moment because it was fresh. This is something we never saw before. So it was, it was new for me and to transition into actually working from outside QEH into Blackman and Goddard was a little hard at first. I was a little apprehensive because obviously it's an unknown situation that I haven't been into before. But I trusted that we would have all the necessary PPE and equipment that we needed to deal with the situation. Practical trip, but basic training and stuff, PPE 
the heat suit. I'm gonna put it on and off. Got the main key things in this fine limit. You see it? First, I had to allow myself and prepare myself, whereas you have to remember you have a family home and there are also people in your in neighborhood, whereas you don't want to you know, take by anything home to your family or to the neighborhood. So you have to make sure that you put on your PPE gear the correct way, you take it off the correct way, you do your cleaning the correct way and do your job as good as you can to make sure everyone around you and yourself is safe. Part of the preparation came from the simulations we have done before and part of the training. So that helped to ease uh, a lot of the um, shock and a lot of the um, adjustment so to speak, um, that we needed to do as a staff. So yes, it was kind of a shock for us to get here in the first case, um, but we would have been prepared mentally and we would have been prepared with the adequate supplies and training necessary to actually deal with the patient adequately. We had a few scares and then even before that, that I had to be involved in. In fact, quite early on, we had called the incident command at the hospital because we had a suspected case and I could see the panic in the room. I could feel the panic in the ear and I remember going to swap that individual, um, individual and waiting at the most nervous seven hours of my life to get back that test, which was negative at the time. Just a day or so before we had the first case, uh, we all gathered together as a department. Uh, we also involved uh, orderlies and support staff as well. And we had training in terms of how to properly don and off PPE. We went through certain situations on how we would walk the patient through to the room. If um, the patient was to have uh, an emergency, how we would handle that emergency, uh, etc. On the 16th of March into the 17th of March for the first admission, and we were told that it was a definitive case of COVID in the island. Um, of course, for me as the infectious disease physician, it's something that I trained for the whole of my life and prepared for the whole of my life. But I think preparing for something and actually doing it sometimes is a totally different um, 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 thing. And I remember that incident as though um, it was yesterday. I remember specifically being with Nurse Dotton. I remember specifically going in um, with Dr. Bentley Young. And I, I, we all were nervous. And one of the first things I remember specifically um, is it was a question is who's going to open the door of the ambulance when it pulled up. And I was like, that's easy. I just opened the ambulance and we greeted the patient. I think the team was nervous, but I think one of the things that I've learned so far in this outbreak is that as a leader, I think showing confidence instills confidence in every, all the staff around you. And I remember going and taking the lady off the ambulance, and I, I can't call her name for obvious purposes. But one of the things I remember her telling me, and interesting, she was not even worried about if she was ill. She's like, are they taking pictures of me and can people see it? That was her concern. And I comforted her, we took her in the room and the staff came behind. And it, for us, it was a thrilling experience because at the time, the country, across the globe, people were not really sure what this COVID thing was. We know people were dying, we know it was spreading, people were still uncertain how it was spread, there was uncertainty of, you know, if it affects you, how badly it could affect you, what were the, you know, the sort, of, the sort of challenges that one might be faced with. And for me, um, that for me mentally was the most challenging, not knowing those particular events. I think as time went on and I got to know more information, more studies were done, um, even now to the point of a vaccine, I think my, my whole uh, thoughts between COVID is quite different. Mentally for us, well for me particularly, would be um, praying and, and looking to God for support and then uh, preparing the young ones because what happens to the patients there depends on the young and the young doctors also. So for me that was probably the most important thing in preparing for the challenge of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, I think it was mostly just trying to psych myself up to, to really just deal with the situation. It's, it was the situation we found ourselves in. Somebody had to do the job and it, it it's, comes with the job, comes with the territory, you know. It's not something that we would have expected, but it is something that we found ourselves in. And as I said, the fact that we had adequate training and that we had adequate PPE, I think went a long way to being a little reassuring. Initially we had the, you know, had some initial nerves which quickly settled but then I would have called on all my years of experience in the critical care arena in terms of, you know, looking after patients and I had also had experience in looking after infectious patients in the hospital before the COVID patients. My 
expectations was to make sure I go and do what I know I was supposed to do, taking care of help, taking care of the patients, taking care of yourself, and do what you're supposed to do. It was more so a shock for the, the patient um, to be the first one to, to be identified as first positive COVID patient. She was concerned about the news of Sam getting out, etc. Um, but we reassured her, we allowed her to know that, you know, we are going to take very good care of her. Um, she ended up doing very well and being discharged um, sometime later. Um, and she had a, a pretty reasonable, reasonably good experience and that's because of the professionalism and we were able to ease her mind and she felt very comfortable and I think that was the, the most important thing for us. I think for the first set of patients that we had, there was a little bit of um, anxiety. We didn't really know what to expect, especially being in an environment that we had never faced before. Uh, but it became more comfortable and we became um, better at dealing with all the little nuances that would show up uh, that we never kind of predicted before. And so it became easy as we, we started dealing with the first two or three cases. I'll be honest, I think the, the reality pretty much lived up to the expectations. Um, because dealing with respiratory illnesses is something that I'm familiar with working in internal medicine. And this does behave similar to most respiratory illnesses. It's a little more severe than others, um, but it was pretty much on par for what I was expecting. I thought it was going to say a really, really ill person, but she was relatively stable. And um, everything went well after that. After we started to care and from a nursing profession, you with the nursing for a while, you do exactly what, you know, maintain your protocols, your policies, and that was okay. It was okay. Then I had assistance from the staff, the nursing staff were there to help me to put on my PPE, and they took me in to where the patients were. But once you get to in front of the patient, you know, your skills kick in. I had to basically see it as one day at a time and not overthinking the situation and deal with, with every patient as they come. Uh, some may present more different than others, some more sick than others were. Came for those first patients who were really ill, some had died. Um, I had to take some introspection and realize that this is life, it's COVID out there and uh, we need to really, as nurses, step up and uh, find some kind of solace as far as how we're going to really deal with this. So I quickly realized that and everything went well after that. If I would be frankly honest, every day I went to see the patient and sometimes I wouldn't go home. I was just standing there because the expectation is that the patient would get very sick. And that's all we sat all day doing, like, when is she going to get sick? Because we were learning, we didn't know what was going to happen. And if you just, the, the problem with social media is that all we saw on social media was death and dying. And our biggest, biggest thing in our head as healthcare professionals is we have to do the best that we can in the circumstances which we have. And all I would do is stand every day and ask every single detailed question. If you know me, I'm a very meticulous person, but I, I went beyond meticulous trying to figure out, is this happening? Is there sats flying? Check it again check this again and of course it went very well um, for our first set of patients. Unfortunately we had the loss very early on of seven deaths which was a challenge for me and a challenge for the healthcare professionals but I think um, as the, the event went along we learned more. We saw what's going on globally and I think um, not yet publicized but I think one of the one of the most encouraging things for me in most recent times was the events that happened right here in this facility and we had a first ventilated patient um, come off the ventilator and they're now at home. That's something we haven't said yet to the public. Uh, and that's important. We had 90 year olds going home. These are people who in probably other countries probably wouldn't have made it. We had 70 year olds going home with, with lots of comorbidities. We had a 15 year old who was sick on a ventilator who came off the ventilator in clock speed time and is now um, um, about to be discharged from tertiary isolation. So I think those are huge, huge gains. But I think for me, and I'm always, I've become so staff oriented. But for me, one of the, the best things for me that I think Barbados can pull out of this, this, this crisis that we have been is to see 
our whole healthcare workers at this facility um, and across the other facilities have worked as a family. And that's something that I think you have to work with us to understand. Um, it doesn't mean that we always agree, but we always work together and pull together. Even if there are difficulties, if we were short or something, we find a way around it safely to figure things out. So I think that for me was one of the greatest things, the, 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 the ability of this team to work, I mean, literally work as a family and look out for each other. And tagging on from that, I mean, we have done good well globally in terms of our healthcare sector, in terms of our isolation facilities. For example, like how many of our healthcare workers have gotten ill and ended up in treatment or you know, it, it, it's, it's a very small, minuscule number compared to the rest of the world. And I think that's something that speaks well, certainly for our healthcare workers, for the training and for the sort of efforts that they put in, the long, 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 long hours that they work, which I don't think um, under normal circumstances people will understand how long they work. The most difficult part throughout the whole year as we started to actually see persons whereas patients in a state of mind and that they can't take care of themselves you know and to be there to assist and help that person knowing that they're in a state of mind whereas it was very emotional to be honest with you to actually see someone like that you understand and it was it could have been a it was a very emotional state at that point of time i remember evening i worked with a patient she was she was upstairs the unit when i went up she was in tears she had missed her family when i asked her so she asked if i could pray with her so that i did and i tell her to just take one step at a time you're missing your family you know so I did pray with her, and by the next morning she was good. And she did tell me that, when she was in all smiles. When we lose patients, I think that's what hits the hardest. You know, you're trying your best, but it doesn't always work out. You always have people that you can go to to talk to, to help settle your minds, you know, you, you, you do things to try and keep your spirits up. One of the most difficult parts uh, was to get to adjust to our new reality, really. Um, and this is not only working at Arsenal Point, but the new reality of uh, the other aspects of, of our living, particularly curfew and not being able to go to certain places, etc. Um, but the most important thing, or the, the biggest thing I've learned over the last year is you know, the importance of, of, of family and, and having persons around you um, to offer good um, encouragement and, um, and advice. Uh, it's something that unfortunately the patients, because of the fact they've been isolated, they, they don't have the families around them and they have to do these things via Zoom. So having um, you know, persons being physically there and being there to support you physically is, is something that I've really and truly cherished and, and valued over the last year or so. One of the difficult things has been to maintain the momentum. Uh, when we had that little down period where there was not as many cases, everyone was kind of getting a little relaxed and then suddenly we had a tsunami of cases. And I think that was the hardest part going into this, was this large quantity of patients that we had, which we had never seen before. Um, fortunately, during the down period, we had done some preparations for it. So it was not as difficult to get everyone mobilized again. But that second wave was probably the more difficult one to, to prepare mentally. We, we didn't expect as many patients as we did as quickly as they came. Well, we actually had started training some additional doctors in October, November, December, and uh, some additional nurses in ICU, so that we would have some extra ICU trained staff as Dr. Ford continued to predict that this tsunami would come. And so I think that preparation is what made the big difference for us, being able to handle all the patients that came to us that were so critically ill. I will have to say, honestly, uh, there's definitely been a bit of COVID fatigue. Um, I, I, as you've mentioned, I've been doing this for a year. Uh, so I've been working with COVID. I'm going home. I'm hearing about COVID all on social media, which I usually use to kind of de-stress. People are talking about COVID. So there's definitely been a bit of COVID fatigue. Um, but that being said, I... I I'm a bit reassured by the fact that our numbers are going down again, so I'm hoping that 
that will be alleviated a bit soon? Definitely would be the mental turmoil of worrying about if I would give my family, my mother, my son, my husband, um, COVID and worrying about them. Man, the long hours away from home. Because uh, currently the team, we do 12 hour shifts. And sometimes that could translate to 16 hours a day. So apart, it's mainly the long periods that, uh, that the team spend away from their relatives that can take a toll on you. One of the most difficult parts over the last year was to see, to me, um, um, healthcare workers get ill. They're not necessarily from Harsons Point or from any of the other outlier isolation facilities, but in our main proper QEH because they're still a part of our family. And that was probably, for me, one of the most difficult things. Certainly um, within a nurse quadrant, it was difficult, but for all of us as healthcare workers, it was difficult because you started to reflect on what possibly could happen to you, um, but you also were sad for the family and sad for the whole medical fraternity. So I think for me, that was, that was one of the, 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 the most um, um, saddest highlights. I think the other thing, if I look at it um, uh, from a different perspective, as a personal perspective, is kind of turmoil. I'm very, I've always said on national TV, you heard me say before, I'm very close to my sister. Um, my sisters, I should say. If I say one, I don't leave the other, I'm my brother. So my sister, like, every day she calls. I remember when this first started, um, to me, I was being more nervous for her than for me because she was always crying and nervous for me. And you know, and I will always say, listen, once I have God on my side, I don't worry about anything. And I will always pray every morning. As I've said before, I think that's one of the things that brought me through this difficulty. And I told one of my patients, one of my private patients the other day, uh, when we had the opportunity to meet, and I, I was very clear and I told them, look, there must be lots of people out there praying for me because the, the amount of stuff that I have to do, I almost work 24 hours a day, if you know me. Um, whether it's running around to all the facilities, whether it's taking care of patients, whether it's having meetings with, with difficult patients, or having meetings uh, or challenges with patients with, with regards to treatment, like sometimes I feel, you know, like how am I able to do this normally? Because just the, the sheer amount of pressure, um, whether it's from, from different entities as to make, getting things to work, getting things to function, coordinating things to make sure they're okay, making sure the facilities don't get too full, that they become overflow, and the movement of patients. There's just so much that is to be done, that is done. Um, and, and I know that myself, normally as a normal human being, it is quite difficult for me to say that that's just me. I believe there's lots of support and prayer and the staff are always there to back you up in those difficult times. I think those, that's, to me, that's, that's the key. There must, there must be more, more, more to it. And I, and I always say I believe strongly that it's, it's for sure the prayer and the support. You know, everybody sees me say, I'm praying for you. I say, I know, I know. And they say, how you know? I said, don't, don't ask. I won't tell you. But, but I know internally that the amount of things I have to do and the amount of challenges that I face, it could only be with the help of God. The most difficult part has been, in my mind, unfortunately, has been the absence of the families at the bedsides of the patients, especially those persons who unfortunately deceased. Um, it was difficult because the family was not able to share those closing moments with their relatives as they, as they transitioned, as they transitioned. So, um, now let me take this time to assure the public that the nursing team that looked after those patients, they're prayer warriors among us, and we took over the role of the relative in terms of comforting the patients as they were going through their final moments. Right now I have turned into a gardener. <laughs> I spend a lot of time in my garden. I also do a lot of baking, and that tends to relax me a bit. Part of my distressing um, regimen essentially is um, a nice day at the beach. Um, that's one of my favorite places to go and, and distress. Um, and uh, just to get away from everything, the noise, the confusion, um, the, the challenges that one might have, and just get that time to relax and to, to self-reflect. Well, I have a, a good group of friends and colleagues, and I also have about 20 dogs so I have another job when I leave up here when I go home so I have I have I have means of relaxing with them well social media does still play a part um, but there are times that I do need to take a break um, but mostly I've been catching up on a lot of rests <laughs> um, also just making sure that I 
maintain open communication with my friends and family um, that emotional and psychological support has been very very helpful uh, in dealing with the the pandemic especially during the periods of lockdown where we're not able to really socialize as much as we were previously um, so mostly trying to, to relax and catch up on things that I otherwise could not catch up on I would either play music um, on my drive home loud and sing along like if I'm at a concert just take myself away completely um, or I would try to watch like Netflix so I try to do something when I got home that was not work related so as so I would not feel like it was always working well I love music I'm an audiophile so I listen to music I'm also an avid avid gardener and this is my favorite time of the year with all the bougainvillea in bloom those are my favorite flowers so I spend lots of time outside the house in the garden working Coping is, is, is handled many different ways and this is going to be a little bit unique in one part but the one thing that I started which I never did before and never had any interest in was gardening. I started to make an orchard and my plants are growing. It seems to be a general trend around all the workers they're like they're going to garden. I, you wouldn't even imagine how therapeutic that is. I don't have a lot of time in the day to do stuff so I do it very early in the morning, 4 or 5 in the morning and very late at evening is when I come home I go and do what I got to do in the garden and that's very 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 therapeutic but the other thing you wouldn't believe that was therapeutic for me which is going to sound very different is actually the patience and that sounds weird but I spend a lot of time and the staff would know I spend a lot of the time actually talking to patients like about how things are going their challenges and just expressing uh, patients expressing their challenges to me and I actually express my challenges to the patients and that's actually that, that's very therapeutic it was very strange because you often think that you're the doctor and you're supposed to be fielding all all of that information but I think for me spending hours and hours the staff will tell you I go sometimes talking to patients sometimes six and seven hours in that hot suit just talking to patients see how they're going see how things are going and then you know relaying back my challenges that I have and then I think it's encouraging for both individuals it's unique but it actually works quite well for me. I really would like to continue in, in the field that I am right now and to, to build more knowledge in depth into infection prevention and control is something that really has boosted my confidence and, and have more pushed me in a, a focused path. I heard a lot of people saying they would probably like to go about the partying and stuff, but for me, I would love to take a, a nice little vacation with my, my daughters because I have not had that experience, especially with my seven month old daughter now. So I would really love to hold them and, and take them on a nice vacation. Traveling, traveling. Get to go, going back and see my family and getting to go to see other places and see my family and friends. Everything can be back to normal and we can enjoy ourselves with our family and when they're putting this pandemic, it's got all barbians to be free and we can get back to normal. Well, that this is over, I still want to continue as, you know, a part of the QH team to work same way and taking care of people, taking care of others and, you know, to build and to educate myself more for sure in case something else comes about again to further myself not only as from the environmental department services but say to be a nursing assistant. I think getting back to some sense of normalcy uh, really is uh, what I look forward to. Um, I think a lot of persons as well, Barbadians as well, do look forward to getting back to some level of normalcy. Do, do getting back to you know, having persons close to you, you can be able to embrace with a hug, a kiss, um, you know, having that camaraderie and that social aspect that um, has been somewhat limited over the time that we've, we've been through this pandemic period. Uh, either traveling to my family or having my family come back home. Travel. I'm, I'm really looking forward to traveling. Um, this is the longest I've gone without traveling. So that's definitely one of the things. But I also think that one of the things I'm looking forward to is really just being able to go out and socialize a bit without as much concern um, and without as much, I don't want to say fear, but there's always that background anxiety of you don't know who could have COVID and whatnot. So I, I think it will be a bit of a sigh of relief a bit um, once we get things under control and hopefully our vaccine schedule is up to date and everybody's partaken so we'll see 
definitely being able to hug and squeeze loved ones. Man, I would love to take my son to Europe on a two-week tour on one of those Viking cruises. The one thing I'm looking forward to do most, which I love doing, which I have not had the opportunity to do, is to travel. I would love to travel the globe, if I had the money to, that is. But, but I would love to, to actually um, um, travel the globe and do a little bit more um, in, in helping other countries in terms of infection prevention control. So that's work-wise, but it's also therapeutic for me. One of the things I, I used to do a lot um, before was to travel, see the globe, um, meet people. And I think and meeting some of those individuals, I think it's really helped me to this point in terms of my career because there are lots of people I've met that really would have warned, those are so many people would have warned me of in, impending trouble. So I think the ability to get on a plane, fly again, um, go to see family, um, and and really uh, get back to enjoying life is going to be important to me. Mind you, I do enjoy my life now. Well, it's always away from home, from family, from loved ones. But at the end of the day, I know that they were there for me, giving me full support. So that makes me comfortable. Well, you made family when they first to work up here. It was a bit of fear in my family and me working up here, but as eventually as I tell you, I mean work here and I get to see it first hand and the experience and how it is, it become mandatory. Definitely, definitely has reduced the time that I have to spend with them and it has made me appreciate what time I do have with them and has caused me to try to ensure that every day I set aside time for them, no matter how busy I am. They were quite supportive because um, as a nurse, I would have worked for a pretty long period and, and they didn't have any hang-ups or any issues with me working with the COVID patients. It's a demanding job, yes. Um, you spend a lot of time at the facility, but you still have to strike that balance between you know, work and, and, and leisure. So it hasn't really significantly affected me. Also, we're in the department of the Turner Medicine, we are quite accustomed to um, high and heavy workloads, so we are very much in tune with managing our lifestyles appropriately. Not too badly, I guess. The hardest parts are when you've got shopping to do or chores to do and you're so far away. Um, but other than that, it's been okay. Still have to try and make time to do the things that you want to do, the things that you enjoy. We need to keep doing the things that we know we need to do to get ourselves out of this COVID pandemic. So we've got to keep sanitizing, keep wearing our masks, keep social distancing, trust in God, and keep supporting each other and looking out for each other. We are in this together. Um, this is a fight that we um, must all play our part in. Uh, we must sanitize, we must social distance. And I know a lot of persons are, are experiencing fatigue in terms of mental fatigue. They're tired of hearing the same message. They're tired of you know, having to, to, to have their lives interrupted, but it's something, it's a necessary evil and it's something that we need to do um, in order to fight this pandemic. I think as everyone has said already that we need not to drop our guard. Um, as the restrictions get less and less, people tend to jump on the bandwagon and think it's all over. And we should learn from the lesson that we learned in December. So let's do this slowly. Let's keep wearing our masks, let's keep social distances, and you know, keep God first. And I think that we'll make through this, get through this quite okay. Just maintain the same precautions, maintain social distancing, maintain the hygiene practices, the face masks. Uh, just try not to become complacent because we don't want to find ourselves back in the situation that we were in in December. I would say that I think we need to learn from this experience to tighten up on our hygiene generally. It has shown us how being more hygienic can improve outcomes. And also for us as a people to appreciate times that we spend with loved ones and cherish moments even more. COVID is still a revolving situation. We don't know everything about the disease. So my advice is to follow the scientists and follow the the objective sources that give information on COVID and stick to all the various protocol, protocols that are put in place. Because sometimes persons may let down their guard because there are no symptoms. And as we, as nursing professionals, we will see one day you're well and next minute, you know, it all goes south. So please take COVID-19 seriously.
everybody, who I, I guess, who did this interview is going to say, physical distance, watch your hands, wear your mask. Yes, I'm going to say that too, but I'm going to take it a little bit further. But I think you, the other thing that I think Barbados must get from this is that they have to understand the importance of unity and community. And that sounds weird, like where is that coming from? That's coming from the perspective of one of the things I've recognized with COVID is that Barbados have now gone back to what I thought was when I was, a, was much younger, which is a more community-based focus, checking on old granny who lives up the road, who probably in, you wouldn't have to normally check on, check on your neighbor to make sure everything is okay. Um, I see people standing in lines. If an older person comes, they let them in front of the lane. The things that I see now that people have reverted to um, that they had lost and I think that whole community spirit um, has come back to an extent uh, even in some of the the, the smaller communities uh, and some of the larger communities in Barbados I have actually seen that and certainly um, I've also seen even among patients who've come in um, there I know there, there are people who come in from neighborhoods who probably never spoke to each other um, people have mentioned that to me they live in the same neighborhood as X but don't communicate but in the setting where they came into isolation they communicate so I want to encourage Barbados to continue that that community spirit uh, to come to that love for a fellow man and also to, to continue to observe um, these rules. I don't think that we're gonna be away from COVID um, um, for any time soon, uh, prior to popular belief. I think it's something we might have to live, live with, um, but I also believe that there are other things you can do to help you to live with it, such as being vaccinated. We salute all COVID warriors in Barbados and throughout the world.